Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's so great to have you here. Have you ever had a hard drive crash? <laughs> yes. My hard drive failed this past week. You had a I'm backup, saying, though, right? Failed. Failed. Um, no, I didn't have a backup, but that's me. In my scenario, I didn't need a backup because I don't store anything on my hard drive. Oh, okay. Right. So I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When because... my hard drive failed, there was no backup. Oh. There was like seven years of photos. See, my life is about central management of data. So like, this is how I'm able to use like a Pinebook Pro to do right. video editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about that so last week. So I'm remoted in through a VPN connection to a massive server that has I, I, I iSCSI access to massive storage. Right. So I don't need any kind of storage on my devices. So when my hard drive failed, I'm saying failed, <laughs> it, uh, it didn't take any of my data with it. It just was a bit of an inconvenience. I had to put in a new drive and, uh, and get back up and running get everything reinstalled but what was a little frightening about this particular failure uh -huh. that i have never encountered in my entire career as a computer technician in my entire life Ooh. is that when i walked in to my office there was a stench of melted electronics oh no oh i don't have very good photos but what i have i will give you <laughs> My hard drive caught on fire overnight. Oh. Yes. So within the chassis of my computer, which is like an aluminum yeah. case, there was a fire. Wow. Gulp. Yeah. So when you think about, so then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, all the time. I've never seen this happen before. No. Ever. Wow. And there's nothing that I have ever done that should have caused that. There's no, oh. there's nothing that I did to do that there's uh -oh. no there's no the, dust build up no the computer is perfectly clean under my desk and is is never moved it's statically set up and it just was it was a a cheap ssd i think wow. and it literally caught on fire inside wow. the chassis so the fire was contained the computer was okay thankfully but huh. stunk like a beast no doubt for about three days but the drive itself was so baked did you contact no no i replaced it with a good kingston hard yeah of course SSD. You did. yeah i did and reinstalled my stuff and you know i'm back up and running in a few hours like but, how come you didn't do this the first time but it really did make me think about all those times that i've thought about doing like wooden builds <laughs> 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 you know like mm, maybe Not a good idea. it was a really good thing that my computer chassis was made of aluminum Yes. Maybe that, and, and fairly airtight to the point where not a whole lot of oxygen can get in once, once it's expelled. Right. Yeah. You know? So like the burning didn't affect any of the other components? No, because it was in the, in the drive tray. So it was contained right. within the tray. So, so the tray itself actually had some plastic components as well. Yep. Those plastic components melted and dripped down. Wow. But the so it wasn't like a flash burn. It was like no, it was a fire. Going. It was a fire inside the case of the hard drive. Yeah, uh, the SSD. It was a, a uh, and that's the crazy part space. is that it's an SSD. Like I, I could see that maybe with you know traditional hard drive with yeah. like moving parts, but an SSD to catch fire. I would be really proud if it was like a moving parts thing. Like I worked that beast so hard, <laughs> I got it up to fifteen billion RPM. That's right, and then. Poof, Wow. No, but it must have burnt for a while. It, it was pretty bad. So, so did you, but, did you get alerts or did you like what? Nah, this is just my desktop computer. I didn't have NEMS running, <laughs> monitoring on it or anything like that. However, ne because the board, the, uh, it did make me think because the motherboard has USB ports on the motherboard. Yeah. I think I might put a temper device in my computer chassis. Mm -hmm. And a temper device is like a USB uh, thermal sensor mm -hmm. and, they, yeah, we, and they, we there's a humidity a, sensor an well. episode with one we of did those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so do that so Please. imagine putting that in yeah. and then i could have gotten an alert from nems linux that said 
hey, your computer is 140 no, degrees Celsius. And, you, and would you have been like, oh, that that's must weird. be a mistake. <laughs> Gotta check the programming. <laughs> that would have been a little bit of a strange alert it, for sure. Yeah. However, you can trust NEMS that the, that, the yeah. data is accurate. So wow. then you would have Ew. gone to see it in action. Brought some marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thankfully Wonderful. it was contained because it, that could have impacted yes. the entire office. Yeah, but doesn't it make you think about like all these like builds that I'm doing and, and some of them made of cardboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm really kind of rethinking the materials that I use for my builds. And, and you know, I think about KKSB cases for, for single board computers and how they're like solid steel, mm -hmm. bent and fabricated steel. And that just says quality to me and like yeah. that's gonna that's gonna protect Fire. me in event of like a short circuit or something yeah, like that I, I don't know what happened to the drive it was like an internal thing i've never had a hard drive catch fire. never I've never had power supplies i haven't i've never oh, i've never had a EPS? fire like that yeah oh. yeah it was the computer that i built i don't know four years ago six months in all of a sudden i'm like what is that smell yeah, uh -huh. and then I, I went down to the computer and i realized I've burnt oh, the, like, and stuff. it smoked that sure thing. But I've burnt capacitors. I've had things burst. Yeah. But I'm talking this caught on fire. Ooh, like, wild. literally. I wish Not from heat. This was like a it. short circuit in the power lines or something Ooh. within the drive. The crazy stuff. So, so I mean, hey, I've never seen it happen before. But hmm. now I know it could happen. Yeah, now yeah. it's scary. Could it really? Mm. It could actually it happen did happen to Robbie. What are the stats I want? I think we should all try to simulate it. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> boy, oh I boy. wonder if there's a kid, like, there is some data as to what could cause an SSD to light on fire. What's on the inside Don't of an SSD? I think it's a very common thing. What What's on the inside of it? What is the. You've got a, a PCB circuit board with, with, um, with memory modules. Yeah. Essentially. And, and some resistors and all kinds of little circuits huh. and stuff. But, but so something moved. in there, no, yeah. and there's no moving parts. And so something in there short circuited, I think, and maybe like 12 volt hit something else and decided to explode and catch fire. I don't know. What's interesting is that it happened when you weren't in the office. Because if it happened yeah. while you were in the office, you, it might have taken a while for you to figure out. I might have been like, okay, my computer's on fire. Like, because yeah. you would have smelled it. It was yeah. Yeah. brutal. Yeah. You might have ruined your computer with like a fire extinguisher at that point. Maybe. Yeah, it's probably Yikes. good. It's probably good that well, happened when you were. But an electrical fire contained within an aluminum box is yeah, hopefully pretty safe. But if it, the best of the bad scenarios. It was in one of my wooden chassis. <laughs> not Perhaps a, not so not bad. a good yeah. scenario. Why do I smell charred hickory? <laughs> wow. Speaking of burnt, uh, have you tried any healthy foods lately? I am always trying healthy foods, Jeff, <laughs> because I, I'm learning from the technology that I've invested in. Now, yep. my budget was a hundred bucks, as you know. So a few weeks ago, Still. we started looking at the various technologies like my fitness tracker, like my smart scale that allow me to educate myself about my health, to be able to lose some weight inevitably as kind of a side effect of that. Um, and I have consistently... So, so whenever I tell you how much I've lost, it's it's only based on consistency. So if I if I hit 7.6 pounds loss and then i went back to six point i'm gonna i'm not gonna tell you seven but i've been consistently beyond the seven pounds mark now that this is week awesome. so another yeah. couple pounds since last week and i've only been doing it for a month and it's just by educating myself but part of that jeff is yeah eating a little well eating healthy but i've cut carbs uh as much as i can from my diet right. because i learned about the fact that I'm burning carbs instead of burning fat. And it's right. working as really, it actually is working. So yeah, I did like, uh, I, I've been using cauliflower instead of rice. So ground up cauliflower. Yeah. It's actually That's delicious. Actually delicious. Yeah. yeah. So and it's like a, a rice substitute, but there's no carbs. So, so good. But it's just like a plate of vegetable instead of rice. You can cut up some green onions. Yeah. Toss them in there. Mm. Oh, yes. I had that pizza last Mushrooms time. and stuff like that. I would, I'll have pizza once a week. Like I get a cheat day once a week. So I took my daughter, um, for, for pizza and we had like a cheese pizza and you know, that's, that's fun. Um, I also have started. So now I'm at that point where I've kind of not plateaued. I'm still losing weight fairly consistently, but fairly slowly. 
So one of the things in, we have a Biggest Loser channel on Discord, mm -hmm. and Marshman had mentioned that one of the things I can do to kind of accelerate things is to, um, to sustain exercise in such a way that, okay, like if I run up mm -hmm. the stairs, yeah, my heart rate gets going, but then it's, it settles back down because right. I'm done. <laughs> well, so do things that are going to sustain a little bit more exercise, essentially. So I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary. Like I'm not really changing my life or anything because it's got to be within reason for the way that I live. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I gave my my uh, 12 year old a, a piggyback ride at while we were at Walmart. That works. And I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, holy cow, I burn a lot of calories doing that. <laughs> I actually kind of started to get sore legs from right. doing that because like he's 12 years old. He's a big, big guy. And, and so for him, it was a lot of fun. It was a great time yep. for me. It was like, this is a great, great way to sustain that kind of heart rate. So mm -hmm. that was something. And then I took my youngest, uh, who's nine. I took him skating last night. Oh, so that's all right. we just, we found an outdoor skating rink here in Barrie, Ontario and uh, we strapped on the skates for the first time in a couple of years. Nice. And uh, and we skated for an hour and fifteen minutes or so. And, and that time again flew was just by because it flew skating. by. Yeah. Yeah. And it was fun. And and for him again. So it, for for the kids, it's like this is great daddy time. Mm -hmm. For dad, it's great dad child time. But also at the same time, I'm I'm I've got that kind of side motive of hey, I'm doing things with the kids that are. Yeah. Trying to get me to be more physically active as a computer geek. And I mean, because plant, I'm planting that's, the I'm through seed through. for your children that this fun activity stuff mm -hmm. is is actually fun, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're like, I'll go outside and play, and you don't do it yourself, it it's not as much fun as if you know, dad's out there actually. Oh, sure. Like, playing around. And, and I was also surprised, like something like finding an outdoor skating rink that the city maintains. Like they have a Zamboni at their outdoor skate yeah. skating rink. Like this is serious, real deal skating and it's free, which is awesome. Tax dollars pay for it. So you just go and strap on your skates and go and skate as long as you want. And it's yeah. open until 10 PM. So for me, it was like, this is a really, really cheap outing cost us nothing to, but, to yeah. go out. So that was fantastic. So See, you're living healthier. I, quite frankly, am just not caring too much right about now, but I will say That's I, fine. I had it's... a very busy weekend Yeah, and on Saturday and Sunday, my watch rewarded me for beating my daily activity goals. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> for the win, because I had stuff to do and a house to clean. There you go. But it was nice. good. I will say though, um, I think my steps are lower today than they were <laughs> last week. I'm at 1,878 oh steps. Now, yeah. Sasha, you have a competition. I got forty five hundred. Yeah. But I'm, hey, at, I'm at seventy five hundred. Okay. So that's lower than last week. That's lower than last week. week. Last week I was in competition. Well, that's and right. So that, did you I... cheat? Did you? No, end up I don't cheat. Eat. Well, no, because no. we had that conversation Although, where you could I go like this. I will say there has been no. some discussion in Discord on what cheating really is. Um, I play video games, and it ups my step count. And I don't you were saying you're using this as a way to maintain, like I'm doing with the piggyback rides. Exactly. Maintain that. So, it doesn't feel like cheating to me. So no, that's did you out. use activity yeah. manipulation to win your contest? No, I did. No. Okay. So did what did anybody? you do this week? Yeah. Oh, this week I beat Crimson Fang. What? <laughs> oh, <laughs> tell us about it. it. Okay. So, Is this like a real workout? Yes. Well, okay. in virtual you reality. Have, I was going to say, you have to clarify though, what Crimson Fang is. Okay. So I have an, uh, Vive, an HTC Vive. And I play a game called Knockout League. So in that game, there's a series of competitors that you fight against. Boxing. And I boxing. I was in a boxing match. And they are tough. They're beasts because they're not based in reality. They can do things that I cannot do. Oh. Um, and I was really stuck on Crimson Fang, like for a long time, because she wears this mask. And if you punch too slow, the mask will bite you. Oh, dear. And I was, and, and. Just like real box. The oh, fight. Based on reality, the mask <laughs> bites you. <laughs> what? And. Mike Tyson didn't need a mask. <laughs> the fight, and the fights last six minutes. And oftentimes when I lose, I lose like at the five minutes and 30 second point. So I can oh, only. So you don't have that staying power for the full six minute round. Yeah. Okay. So I had to really work myself up to the cardio of a six minute fight. I don't understand how they do 
rounds of this against real competitors. It was intense. Anyway, so my ne my next opponent is going to be a long way off. It's so was this like exclusively a cardiovascular kind of like? Yes. Like, do you feel it in your in your? You feel like, it in your everything. There's no. There's no. There's no physical interaction, right? Well, you're holding on to the controllers, right? Not that they have a lot of weight, but you're also like swinging, punching, yeah, yeah. deking, dodging. So like it's a full body deal. Like it's... Gotta try this sometime. You have to try so it. Cool. How long ago did you build that computer? Two years ago? A couple years, yeah. Weren't we supposed to have like a yeah, we, VR, oh, yeah, 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 VR yeah. day? Yeah. We ought to have Sasha, a Sasha, let's do VR. that. All right. Next, like next Wednesday. Die. <laughs> <laughs> Before I we wish. get there. Very cool. Oh, that's exciting. So however you decide, I mean, this is, for me is part of my kind of New Year's resolution, but my New Year's resolution is really just to educate myself. That's how, that's my approach. And I am finding that by educating myself, I'm learning more about how things work and I'm losing weight. I've lost over seven pounds in the past month, which isn't huge, but for me, I can see it in my face. I can yeah. feel it in my body. And, uh, and I'm excited about, you know, where I'm going to be six months from now. I feel like I'll be healthier. Yeah. That's all it's about. Six months from now. Yeah. So will Seven I. Seven pounds is huge. Don't, well, don't be like, it's not huge. That's huge. That's it's a, it's a great achievement for sure. Yeah. yeah. No. And I feel great about it. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that at all. I'm just yeah. like, it's not like I lost 20 pounds in a week. No. Like some no, people do that. Still no, seven, I'm just seven pounds. I haven't done anything other than change just my knowledge. But that's what about 4%. For you, seven pounds. I don't know. Don't make me do math today, Jeff. Please don't. <laughs> See for me, but seven pounds. Whatever, whatever it is for you, um, I just encourage you to like check out the technologies that are available. If you've ever had trouble with uh, with if it's weight loss or if it's like keeping the New Year's resolution, there's tech that's available, like the fitness tracker, like that scale that is encouraging me by giving me information about. Um, like BMI and and stuff that I didn't know about before. Uh, my metabolic age. I've lost two years off my uh, off my meta metabolic age, so I'm now two years younger uh, in the past month. So that's huge. Um, so those kinds of things are really good encouragements, and and they'll help you to be able to achieve the goals just by educating you and 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 helping you to see how the things that you choose to eat and do are affecting your health. So uh, it's working for me so far. So. Maybe it will work for you too. Get into uh, Biggest Loser, Biggest Loser on uh, our Discord channel. So go on to Category Five TV, join our Discord under Interact, and uh, and you'll see Biggest Loser there. It's pretty fun. Cool, cool. Yeah, right. I really want to get into the feature. Well, we've got to take a break first, Jeff, and then when we get back, Jeff has got something for you, folks. So stick around. I have three kids at home. We all have devices. My wife, yep. myself. I've got a phone in my pocket at all times, except at night when I need to charge it. Mm -hmm. My kids each have, you know, we have a variety of phones that the kids share for video games and for chatting and things like that. So there's always stuff hanging out of wall outlets. Oh my We've goodness. got a wall wart with a cable and people fighting over, hey, he's using my charger and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always. It's just the way it is. So, Jeff, you talked about a couple of weeks ago how you've come up with a solution for kind of centralizing your charging station. And it really yes. made me think. And I started looking and I found a, a pretty fantastic device that uh, that I think you're uh, you're going to yeah. show us today. G-Cord. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you're right. I do have another device. It's not the G-Cord. Uh, I bought it around Christmas time. Yeah. And... It is a six bank um, docking station that um, allows the kids to place their phones. But we have, again, three kids. But between them, they have their old phones and their new phones. Right, yeah. They don't want to give up the old phones because, well, my Minecraft files are on that old phone. Yeah. So <laughs> all in all, I think there's like six phones and two tablets. And, sure. And it's like there's same deal chargers everywhere and everywhere. then one goes missing and I'm like this is ridiculous but we also had the issue of they were sneaking them at night and we're like we need a centralized location where it's like i know where they all are so we got this charging port and they all just sit there and so yeah it's been it's been great 
And so does this so have that feature got. where if the kids grab it after nine, it zaps them? <laughs> uh, no, uh, that is that, would that be is frowned upon. Feature request. <laughs> it deletes all of your files. There you go. <laughs> hey, that's, that's what I'm telling the kids. <laughs> okay. If you touch the phone after nine while it's on the charging station, it will delete everything. That's Ooh, a great one. I there like you that. go. I like that. No. A charging station sounds like a great idea for me because it puts everything in one place and it, and it gets rid of all the cable clutter. Yes. So can yeah. we see what, what yeah. you have here? Okay, so this is uh, from G-Cord. It is a six-port, 10-amp USB charging station. Now, I will say right off the hop, what caught me off guard from the box is at the side, it says quad USB. Like, but it's six port. Okay. Why is it quad USB? It's because you've got different types of USB. So oh. there is a, um, there's three piece eight pin. There's two piece micro USB and then one type C. Oh. Interestingly okay. enough. So my phone is type C, but mine is the only one that's type C within our household. Everything else is USB micro. Right. Although there is one Apple device, which uses the old Apple interface. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have so, Apple at home. So, so all right, I'm it came with some cables? It does come with That's some it. cables. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to open this up, so I'm just going to yeah. slice through that and place that over here. So, um, what do we have in here? Starts with... I like that it's 10 amps, so you've got yeah. like one cable going to the outlet, and you don't have to have mm -hmm. like a whole bunch of chargers, right? It's just one thing. Box is empty. Nice. All right. So it is a six port or um, six channel. So, okay. all right, to start with, here's your various cables. Yeah. And okay. So these are, oh, so it came with little short, okay. like one yes. foot, one foot cables. These are, uh, I've got a USB-C and two USB micros. Yeah. So they're just nice little short cables and tied these with are a tie wrap. your Apple connections. Okay. Oh. So it came so, with it. So these are just tr like for your Android phones. Yep. And then and these, these are for Apple. Apple phones. So if you are using this, <laughs> <laughs> but if you are using this and all you have is Android, three is not going to be enough. So you need to make right. sure that you've got the right. Okay. So when you Connection. buy this, what do you do, Jeff? You buy some extra ones. All right. Look at it. Oh, and they're color coded. Yeah, so we got some nice color coded ones, which my kids would absolutely love because. Yeah. Then they'd be able to say, well, I've got the pink one. I've got the blue one. And, you know, it solves everybody's problems based on the color coding. <laughs> Perfect. Things you have to do to, like, stop fights at home. It's crazy. Oh, those are nice, too. So, yeah, these are very nice. These, right. are, these do not come with it, so you have to buy separately. So whatever works for you. So we got three with it. Well, two USB micro and one USB-C. Yes. And then we've got a bunch, just a pack, a sorted pack here. Now, everything that you see is available at cat5.tv slash charger. Yeah. You're right. These are nice. Yeah. yeah check yeah, those out. They're, these are like wound, woven, those nice cables, but they're color-coded, so the kids will love that. All right, so I have unboxed. Okay. Really, what we have is you have the base unit. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, a power cord? I'll plug in the power yeah. cord while you're describing this. the power cord, you have the instructions that are just not simple, full out. Not a wall wart. No. Just so you know. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this yeah. is just going to go right into your, your outlet nicely. And your plastic plexi dividers. So cool. these are... Like heavily sealed. <laughs> separate these puppies somehow. Use your teeth. I it's like air compressed. Oh wow. <laughs> they're vacuum sealed. Yeah, vacuum sealed. Oh my god. Oh, here we go. This one. Oh, they're not vacuum sealed, they're just oh, stuck stickers. on either side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My goodness, that one feels vacuum sealed. This has got power now, Jeff. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, I'm not gonna plug it in yet because I'm gonna be playing around with these, but All right. is there a special way these go in? Does not look oh yes, there is. Okay. So you can't really see it, but there's little notches here, which prevents you from putting this in backwards. So if I do that, it's not going in because there's uh, little yeah, yeah. nobules there. Is that a nobules. Then they, oh, it clicks in. Perfect. So oh. come out. All right. Grab another one. Do you want me to help? Yeah, I can help. Yeah, sure. Here, do you want to? Yeah. You do the. There All right. This is this takes three, folks. It's teamwork. This is crazy. How many? Invite some friends over. How many techies does it take to? Put dividers on a cell phone charging station. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. There, okay. So we can get two phones in there. Look at this team action. So much happened. faster. Four. I'm so I competitive. Can't this I'm one. like, see, so exactly. I win. Yeah. I win. I win. Okay. See, so, Give me another one. Like, here. This is the one I struggled with. Okay. <laughs> All right. Getting these suckers in there. I feel like if you're the person who changes the garbage nice. at home and then you need to open the bag, the new bag that's all stuck together, you know. Yes. The trick. All right. All right. Last one's going in. Okay. There we go. 
All right, uh, USB C. It has been assembled. My... Okay. Okay. So uh, right away, what I can see on it, you have your physical switch button for power. Yeah. Uh, your connectors are all on one side. Interestingly enough, so the one the unit I have at home, the connectors are on either side. So I've got oh. three and three. Oh. What I like about that is it prevents all the cords from jumbling up on one side. Right. This one, they're all on one side. So your device is going to have to sit because it's a short cable with the charging port going that way. So depending okay. on any case you have on your phone or any anything like that, <laughs> it may cause problems. But just for plugging it in, oops, of course. It's USB. Time. You got to do it yep. three different ways. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it just sticks in quite simply. All right. Uh, let's cool. find the one for... This is pretty simple tech, folks, but yeah. Yeah. it really... I did a USB-C for my phone. Oh, perfect. Okay. It's already connected to my phone because I thought, hey, we so can actually try, like, see if, it, it in. see if it explodes or if it charges. It's going to do one of those two things. Yeah, those are the only two options. You're going to learn one day the way to plug it in. I know. So that I, I you only I have to do it, it out, once. I haven't. So, okay. So that is plugged in. The yeah. charge or the... Um, Actual power cable connects here to the side. I do like that it's just a single power cord and then just a couple of... Oh, is it charging so right now? Yeah. It is. Did it come on? Yeah, it did. It is charging. So I've powered it on. Yeah. You can see that. Oh, no, it was off. Now it's on because the blue lights kicked on. Oh, neat. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, His can you guys see that? Little on? blue light right there. I don't know if I, if I were to dim the lighting in the studio here, I don't know if you'd be able to see that a little bit better. Oh, maybe. Tip Perhaps. it up, Jeff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So a little you bit. See the blue light now, and when I turn it oh, off, oh, I notice that it's only the blue light is only on on the one that the two that are plugged in. Oh. Oh, look at that! Look at you, you observant fella. So yeah, okay. So you've got the power, and then the one that is plugged so let's in. Plug in more. That's see cool. what happens. So let's see plug everything in. The connector, connector. Got your phone? For Where's your phone? phone? I can get my phone. What What are you looking for? C? Yeah. I only have one C. All right. You got to buy the right cables, folks. But there's find, one that came Find with it, the right? one. Well, I'm using it on my phone. But where's my phone these C. threaded ones? Those are all C, uh, USB micro. Oh, okay. So you didn't get yep. a diversified pack. Okay, fine. Yep. All right. Well, let's test it this way. If I move the connector to another port. Yeah. It did? Yes. It I lights up the bang one that's on. charging. Look okay. at that. Cool. Look at that. So, so we actually right? see okay. the blue lights up. Oh. USB C as well? Yep. USB C. Sorry, Sasha. What? Um, okay, so <laughs> it is the in there. It is charging. This one has, I believe, built-in surge protection and stuff like that. Like that's one of the concerns yes. that you have. So it has built-in surge protection. It also has intelligent charging with over voltage, overcharge, and over current protection. Nice. Mine does not have that. Mm. And truthfully, when I was looking for a banking station, that wasn't something I was thinking of. I just wanted right. the ability to have all the phones. Power ports. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so that's a nice, very nice feature. Um, and it is 10 amp, 50 watt total power. Mm. Uh, what I don't see though is fast charge. I don't mm. see that either. And, and it's a good comment because that's one of the questions we're going to get. So yeah. no, it looks like it's just straight, like just regular, charge. regular charge power. Yep. Now this particular one, now I'm sure those exist, but I mean, we're talking about charging six devices simultaneously, which is pretty impressive. It's pretty good from a single power. I, I also like the stability of this one, Jeff. It's very solid. Doesn't move. Now, one thing I noticed about the one that I had at home, for the life of me, I can't think of the model or the, the brand that mm -hmm. it is. There's and a I, lot out there. Like, just, Oh, there's tons. Yeah, yeah. Search for them. But what I wanted to check with yours is the gap between the uh, placement spots. Oh. So my phone has a bit of a, a dip on the back. Right. Where it's a bit it, thicker. Yeah, it is thicker. Mm -hmm. And so your phone sits quite nicely. It's leaned back. Mm -hmm. When I put mine in, because of that, it sits up does pretty that, much. Okay. Does that now does I that if matter? you go forward that bothersome? Well what it does create a problem is if you ha if you're trying to organize all your devices succinctly it doesn't work as well if one of them's falling forward, it bounces them all around, especially you if you color got code your phones when you put them in the charger. No, but for the one I have at home, <laughs> I have to do it in a certain order because of the different case sizes. Ah. Otherwise, one goes forward, they all fall. Oh, okay. You got a tablet, right. it knocks them out. So ah, okay. be aware of that. Like so there's all these things you wouldn't even up. think about. Yeah. Exactly. Because of the the gap. I mean, that's that's finger width. That's it. 
Right. So it's not like it's a big gap. If you have a My tablet, gap. your tablet's going to sit fairly Pretty high snug. up. Yeah. yeah. So be aware of that. But otherwise, that's a, that's a nice little... Uh... <laughs> okay, this sucker's small. <laughs> yeah. any, any guesses? Any guesses? iPod first generation. Nice. It's crazy. Yeah. It doesn't even like the when they came with the like full touch screen. But that fits quite nicely. But yeah, I mean if you have a tablet or something, it's gonna sit a little bit higher. And you could see like mine is back on an angle now because that little knob is not there. But if you had a, a a tablet with a thicker case, it's gonna sit straight up. There's no give. And the chance with that is if you accidentally bump it, you could potentially break the plastic. So just be aware. Oh of yeah. That. Like Yeah, I guess. Like, but I mean, you're going to find a, a safe place to put this kind of mm -hmm. device. Yeah. Plain and simple. So, but it keeps it in a centralized location yep. and allows you, you know, especially if you have multiple devices at your home to organize everything. You have all your phones there. You, you know, maybe you've got young kids and it's like, get off the phone. That's your spot where you go. This yeah. is the phone charging sport. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's not in the rooms at night. It's a central location. You know where every phone is, and it's like, oh, you didn't plug it in. It's not this there. This is kind of what I'm thinking. Like, if, if this works as a great charger, which it looks like it's it's fantastic for this, mm -hmm. as a parent, I'm going to hide every other charger in the house. Yes. And it's and just... Stick it to here. Okay, when your phone's dead, put it on the charger. I know. Because, the charger. Because we've it's updated one. to one of, you know, something like this at home, Yeah, I have so many wall connectors now. <laughs> like uh, what am i doing you with need all more this? raspberry pies that's exactly what i need yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah oh that's I great mean, thanks Jeff. Uh, it comes Thank with you. a one-year limited warranty which is kind of nice normal wear and tear cool. seals abuse misuse not covered damage I'm trying to see if there's anything else that's important to mention from the instructions i'm not seeing it um i like that it has the surge protection and everything else because your wall wart, you're just, how many times have you just plugged your phone into the wall? Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. And yeah. what happens if there's a power surge or something? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a bonus as well. Yep. Nice. So yeah, that's it. It is uh, the G Cord 6 port 10 amp USB charging station, specifically the black color. There you go. So <laughs> go to cat5.tv slash charger if you're interested in that particular one. Or of course, follow that link and then you can find various um, alternatives as well. Amazon's kind of cool that way. Mm -hmm. You'll see some of the other options that are similar but different. Uh, if you need quick charge, then I guess that would be really the deciding factor. This one does feel like it's really like quite, it does feel pretty quite sturdy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that like, it really does. It yeah. feels oh, sturdy. It you know feels what? really good. I didn't even notice it. It's got like uh, rubber grip pads in there. Yeah, I felt that when I put my phone so, in. So, you know, which is kind of nice, holds the phone in place. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. Cool. I will say, in having used one of these now, there's one thing that makes me go, you could take this to the next level. That by, zapping feature. Well, the zapping feature would be <laughs> am by amazing. Cordless. Well, <laughs> cor actually, cordless would be kind of cool if these had cordless charging plates. But no, oh, yeah. to allow one USB that al that does data sync for a computer. So all six would be plugged in. You plug it into your computer and it allows so for So you want it to be a hub as well. How cool would a that powered be? powered hub. Tar yes. That would be a nice feature. I guess. But I think that's a whole new level. But, yeah, but then every phone would show up as a... As a hard drive when you plug in your, your charger. No, but think about nightly syncs. Like you got all your family's mm, phones. Back so up your family phones. Yeah. yeah, that would be a neat feature, I guess. That'd be yeah. kind of cool. I don't know if any of the devices do it, but I mean, now that I've used one of these, I'm like, mm -hmm. that would be a cool feature to have. Yeah. Next level. Yeah. Patent all the good that. ideas. Right that, there. Yeah. You heard it here. <laughs> All right, yeah. we've got to take a really quick break, folks. When we come back, I'm going to be showing you an app that allows you to create app-like browser windows on a modern Linux system. Stick around. These days, we're surrounded by things like Chromebooks, Pinebook Pros, and, and devices. I mean, the Chromebook is the perfect example of a device that utilizes the internet mm -hmm. as an app infrastructure. Right. So I think about things like, uh, like my Google Drive and Google Docs and Google Sheets and, and, and how those are very fast becoming my 
applications for doing things like document editing. Mm -hmm. I don't install Microsoft Office anymore. No. Right. I use in my browser my Google Docs. That's what I right. use. That's how I do it. But Even Microsoft, like Word and all that, you can they've got online browser yeah. based. Like Outlook has gone into the cloud. It's mm -hmm. like a browser based thing. But so these are all things that they used to be applications on our computer and now they're progressively becoming more and more cloud driven. And that means they are accessible through your web browser. But there's kind of like that old school feel about having the native app on your computer, having, you know, to do it in your web browser feels like you're going on a website to do it in the app feels like you're opening a program and, and, and there's less screen real estate that's wasted to things like the address bar. Yes. And yeah. Bookmarks and mm -hmm. that kind of prime stuff. example, QuickBooks online. Perfect. Uh, I use that for yeah. an organization that I'm with. And it's funny because I have it installed on the computer. Yeah. But then I can also log in and, and use it online on my personal computer. Mm -hmm. Looks exactly the same. Runs exactly the same. Yeah. But even psychologically within my head, I'm like, I would rather use the app. Right. Because it's the app. It's a web browser and you've got the address bar and everything yeah. else. So there have been applications and, and browsers themselves have things like app mode and, and abilities to create a bit more of a native feel to websites right. so that they feel more like native apps. But there's, it's, it's never really been solidified as a standard. So what rises up and then fizzles away, like Firefox used to have a great mechanism for doing this, mm -hmm. for creating an app kind of uh, window for your, for your browser sessions, but it got discontinued. So then it just fizzled out. But Peppermint OS has done something incredible with a tool that they call ICE. And okay. ICE is, so what they call this is SSB, which is a site-specific browser. But the interface is really unique in that it, it is specifically, it's not a web browser that allows you to save an icon to your desktop that simply opens that website every time you double click on it. No, it's, it creates launchers on your Linux computer mm -hmm. that look like the the, the, they look like a native application. It removes okay. all of that browser um, stuff around the edges and everything else. Oh, very cool. But they've made it very, very simple. But I'm not using Peppermint. Okay. I'm actually using Linux Mint. And on Linux Mint, which is a Debian derivative, it's also, uh, it's based on Ubuntu. And this will go for Ubuntu. What, what I want to show you is for any Debian-based distro. So... That's Debian, obviously, Ubuntu, Mint, Linux Mint. So I'm on Linux Mint 19, and it's uh, it's fine for me to do those thing, uh, this on any of those distros. Okay, so I'm going to jump into my web browser, my current one, which is Google Chrome, and I'm going to jump over to now. Observe this URL that I'm going to type in here: peppermintos.com/guide/ice. And when I bring that up, here we go, an introduction to site-specific browsers. They've got a great example there with, uh, with the Pixel Editor, which is a web-based image editor. But by using ICE, it looks like a native app on the computer. It really does. How sweet is that? The interface is stellar. But because I'm not on Peppermint OS, it doesn't, it's not available okay. on my distro, right? However, Peppermint OS is open source. Right. It's Debian based. If you've got a Debian based machine, you're able to install the things that they have open sourced and compiled for their distro on my distro. So here I am on Linux Mint. Let's see if this is going to work for us. So we're going to grab the source from, not the source, but a, a binary packages from launchpad.net slash tilde peppermint os slash plus archive slash ubuntu slash ice dash dev slash plus packages and this takes us to the packages folder for the ice development 
from the Peppermint OS team. And you see the latest version at the time of this broadcast is version 6.07.0.7, I should say. So I'm going to click on that and let's take a look at what we have here. We've got packages and builds. Here's a build for AMD 64. So because I am on a 64 bit Intel processor, I'm okay to click on that and download the build. There's the Debian package right there. And here it comes. I'm going to keep that file. And then I'm going to click on it. Presumably DPKG is going to try to launch it and ask me what I want to do. What is this web app integration for Peppermint Ice? Front end, blah, blah, blah. Install package. Gotta love the way Linux makes installers these days. Yeah, it's so much easier than the default where you used to have to log into terminal. Yeah. Compiling from source. I mean, you can do that. So maybe you're not on AMD 64 and you need to compile. All right. So uh, that's done. What's changed? Close everything out. Nothing's changed. So I'm going to click on here and I'm going to type in ice. And lo and behold, there's an application now on my computer called ice. And just like that, I've got my simple uh, what is it called? SSB is a site specific browser. They call it a simple site specific <laughs> browser manager. Okay, so it's this easy to create launchers. And when I say a launcher, I'm talking, you know how onerous it can be to add things to like your internet category here? Let's say we want to turn YouTube into an app. So okay. let's call this YouTube. And the URL is https colon slash slash youtube.com. And where on the menu? I'm actually not going to put it in internet, even though it's a website. I'm going to put it in multimedia. Ooh. Wow. What do I want the icon to look like? I'm going to try this use uh, site fave icon. I have yet to see that work. It doesn't seem to work. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to click on my browser and I'm going to type YouTube icon. I'm going to jump into images. I'm going to click on tools. I'm going to click on color. I'm going to choose transparent. Then I'm going to grab a transparent YouTube icon. It doesn't have a background. I'm going to save that to my computer. I'm going to throw that into pictures. I'm going to make a folder called icons and save it there. Done. Now I have a file that quickly. So go into my home, into, where did I put it? Pictures. Where's pictures? There it is. Okay. Um, icons, YouTube. All right. So now I've chosen the YouTube icon. There we go. Do easy. I notice it will support Chrome, Chromium, Vivaldi, or Firefox. So that's the back end it's going to use. Then it also, so I'm going to choose Chrome because that's my browser. Okay. It's detected that I also have Firefox on here, but I don't use it. Uh, create an SSB with an isolated browser profile. That means that within this app, if you will, you are not going to, um, it's not going to share the session with your real browser. So if oh, I've okay. logged into YouTube in Chrome, if I don't have that checked, it will also, it, it will be logged in in the app. So it's almost like an incognito mode, sort of. But it will, no, it's more like its own profile. Okay. So you can log into your YouTube profile but it will only be logged in there. So then simil uh, so by contrast, okay. in Chrome, you will not be logged in. Right. Okay. Cool. So you can choose and, and feel free to play with that setting. See what, what way you want it to be. So I'm going to say, yes, I want this to be an isolated browser with Chrome. And I'm going to go apply. Well, again, it doesn't seem to have done anything. But if I click on my Linux Mint menu and I go into sound and video, I now see a button called YouTube. No way. Huh. Click on it. Uh, these things, uh, let's uncheck these things just because it is, see, because remember it's created a new profile. Right. So I'm going to say, okay. And now I'm going to close that just because now that I've done that, I want to show you from scratch now that I've turned off those things. So sound and video, YouTube, it's not going to ask me those things again. Okay. So YouTube is now its own window, its own app. It's, it's oh. going to behave very, very much like an app. But it's using Chrome as its background, as its backend. Right. So if you find that Chrome performs better than Firefox, choose Chrome. If you find it's the other way around, use Firefox. Right. If you want to remove 
one of those launchers from your menu. So say I want to remove YouTube, I can actually go to remove tab in ICE, highlight it and click on remove and that will actually get, it, get rid of it. You can do as many of these as you want if you want to add like a category five TV. Uh, let's say maybe you want to do the live category five live. So let's do that. Let's go live.cat5.tv. So then um, whenever, uh, and, and you'll probably want our icon for the sake of the, the speed of tonight's demonstration. I'm not going to do that right now, but you already saw how to do that. Okay, so Category 5 Live is under Sound and Video. There it is up there. Again, turn these things off. Oh, I put like a underscore or something. But it's, oh, no, it's, still, it's still working. So so now I've got a, a launcher for category five when, when we're live. So when we're live, we can, boom, there we go. Wow. Inception, right? That's super, super easy. How cool is that? So it is super, super easy, really quick, works really well. It's effective and it's supported. It's open source and it's available on any Debian distro just like that with a D, DEB file. Uh, it's already compiled for AMD 64. And I think you'll, find other com compiles there as well if you dig through. Nice. So check that out. It's called Ice and it's from the folks who bring us Peppermint OS. Thank I you for like it. Thank you for yeah. that. That's a great it's tool. Great. Yeah. Another thing you may want to add to your launchers is the category 5.tv newsroom. Yes, you yes. will. Yeah. Immediately in fact. And now double click on it cuz it's time. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Microsoft no longer sees PlayStation maker Sony and Nintendo as the biggest competition for its Xbox platform, and you won't believe who they see as their biggest threat. An artist tricked Google into thinking that they were ma there were major traffic jams by pulling a wagon filled with smartphones down empty streets. ARM is getting edgy with two new processor designs which bring slimline AI workloads to smart speakers and other Internet of Things devices. And Windows Trust and Abandoned Driver Code lets ransomware burrow deep into targeted machines. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. Some quick honorable mentions this week. A hacker crew managed to temporarily take control of Facebook's official Twitter account. The irony. In a tweet posted on February 7th at 3.50 p.m. on the official at Facebook Twitter feed, the attacker posted, Hi, we are our mine. Well, even Facebook is hackable, but at least their security better than Twitter. They then went on to advertise their services, saying to contact them in order to, quote, improve your account security, unquote. Our mind did not say how they got into the social network's Twitter account, but no self-respecting hacker could, uh, would ever take, uh, pass up the opportunity to blast Facebook's security practices. According to a draft research paper from the astronomers who are analyzing it, a mysterious radio signal from space that was first detected in Canada appears to repeat at regular 16-day intervals. The, the unusual signal, which has been traced back to a spiral galaxy roughly 500 million light years from Earth, is known as a fast radio burst, a.k.a. FRB. It has been fascinating astronomers since Canada's CHIME telescope first detected it in 2018. Scientists have discovered hundreds of seemingly random one-off FRBs over the last decade, but only a handful of them have been found to repeat. Now, here's the thing. This particular signal is not only repeating, but it appears to be sent out at regular intervals. The signal starts, and, and let me just say, this is not sci-fi, this is really reality. The signal starts every 16.35 days. It lasts for four days and then falls silent for 12 days before starting up again. According to the paper, that is a recurring 
schedule. The number of bursts within each four-day blast varied each time according to 409 days worth of data that was compiled by Chime. The study authors say in their abstract, quote, Our results suggest a mechanism for periodic modulation and disfavor models invoking purely sporadic processes. In other words, and this is not a quote, so the quote is over, <laughs> but in other words, the signal is not repeating at random, okay? So they say that the source may be flickering at regular intervals, or some other factor might be interrupting the signal blast in a consistent pattern. Orbits come to mind for me, like that could be part of it, for sure. But if their findings are confirmed, the discovery would be another first in the early study of FRBs, which have only been known to science for a relatively short period of time. Called the ultimate arm-powered NAS, Helios 64 is accepting pre-orders discounted for the first 500. Helios 64 is a full-fledged Linux-powered NAS solution that offers built-in features that you will not find in any other product at this price point. It supports up to 80 terabytes of data storage in five hot-swappable drive bays, plus support for a single M.2 for applications that demand extra performance. For connectivity, it uses the new multi-gigabit speed standard on dual LAN ports. They offer up to 2.5 gigabits per second throughput. The NAS uses an ARM64 uh, hexacore SOC. It features 4 gigabytes of RAM and a 16 gigabyte EMMC for OS storage uh, and booting. Now, it's a NAS that's basically behaving like a Linux computer. So uh, because the Helio 64 is open source, once it's released, we're going to begin seeing distributions created specifically for this hardware. The Helio 64 was slated for release as early as next month. But with factory shutdowns due to the coronavirus, the first shipments will be delayed. An ETA update will be provided by the company once factory lines are allowed to reopen in China, but we estimate it to be late spring or possibly early summer. Pre-orders are discounted to just, are you ready for this? $285 to the first 500 orders. And you can place that order now at cobol.io. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Microsoft no longer sees PlayStation maker Sony and Nintendo as the biggest competition for its Xbox platform. Phil Spencer, Microsoft's head of gaming, said he now considered Amazon and Google as his top rivals because of their cloud computing infrastructure. He believes their transitional rivals, Nintendo and uh, traditional rivals, Nintendo and Sony, are out of step with the future of gaming. He said, quote, when you talk about Nintendo and Sony, we have a ton of respect for them, but we see Amazon and Google as the main competitors going forward. That's not to disrespect Nintendo and Sony, but the traditional gaming companies are somewhat out of position, end quote. With cloud gaming, players don't need to buy a games console. Instead, the games are run on servers in huge data centers with the footage streamed over the internet to a TV, computer, smartphone, or a tablet. It means players don't need to buy discs or download games and software updates, which can take a long time. Google entered the home gaming market in 2019 with its Stadia streaming service. The company's vast cloud computing business means that it has the necessary infrastructure in place, but critics say the lineup of games on Stadia, Stadia is currently sparse. While Amazon and Apple offer games on their app stores and Apple offers a monthly subscription, they don't currently offer a cloud gaming service. However, Amazon also operates an enormous cloud computing business and is rumored to be developing a game service. Sony has offered its PlayStation Now cloud gaming service since 2014, letting gamers stream more than 700 titles to a PS4 console or PC. 
However, it currently streams games in 720p resolution. By contrast, Google Stadia can stream its games at up to 4K resolution. NVIDIA has officially launched its GeForce Now streaming service after months of testing, and both Sony and Microsoft have already announced that they are still working on new games consoles for home. Totally demonstrates the shift yes. in how things are being, uh, how technology is being provisioned. I feel o- old, I guess, in the fact that my brain doesn't get it. Like, I don't understand. Like, I'm still really locked into consoles. Well, it's mind bending. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been sold for so many years that the biggest, most powerful console is going to give you the best gaming experience. Now we're yeah. being told, oh, well, you can do it on your phone. You can do it on this little $100 device. You can do it on anything. Oh, and then you can transition over to your computer, which doesn't even have to be a good computer. It can be a Chromebook. Yeah. Right. What? I think the difference, though, and I mean, admittedly, I have not explored Google and Amazon's gaming services, so I can't speak from firsthand knowledge. Sure. But the ability to go offline is what separates the two. Oh, okay? yes. But, that, when are, yes. But, but maybe that's the idea is that we're never offline anymore. Well, <sighs> and sure we are, but do we really, but when we're at that point, our, it's just... We're always connected, Jeff. But that We're is, always connected these days. You're right. We are always connected. But that's, 5G, 6G. But that's an assumption of um, necessary connectivity. I, like, we see this with our kids all the time. Mm-hmm. They play games that are not online. Mm-hmm. It's downloaded, and that's it. Like, sure, yeah. My, Minecraft is a great one for kids that are younger, where they're playing Minecraft. It's not going online. I mean, you could go to realms and stuff, but <laughs> the difference here is... yeah. If you're going to go with the cloud-based computer uh, uh, gaming services, you're stuck to a couple of things. You're stuck to what they offer Mm -hmm. from the choices and the graphics and all that kind of stuff, which I think, again, I don't know from firsthand, would be subpar compared to what you can pull out of, say, you know, an Xbox One S or, you know, PlayStation 5 with with their graphics. I mean, I can't see playing like Red Dead Redemption 2 on my phone you can't you're see it because you right. haven't seen it yet Let, let's but, just I, like, say okay. still it's from the technological perspective everything's going cloud <clears throat> yes but the the quality so you're saying will it look as good so the quality is not the video the video is your my tv is 1080p so it's 1920 by 1080p regardless of how powerful my system is or right. not so yet for some reason, if I use a first gen Wii versus a PlayStation 4, mm-hmm. I'm going to notice a quality difference of in course. the PlayStation. And and sure, it's a different system. And so it is apples right. to oranges. But what I mean is the power of that more powerful system, even though my TV never changed resolution, it's still the same resolution. The video quality is still the same. Right. Okay. But it looks so much better because that one is so much more powerful. So now take that and put it into a cloud server where this cloud server is still streaming 1920 by 1080 P mm-hmm. to, to my 1080 P TV. Mm-hmm. And yet it has so much power. Yes. Like it's a multi billion dollar system versus my little $400. Right. Console. Right. So, so the, the, the resolution is not the bottleneck now. Our, our internet is capable of streaming 4K video in real time with no latency. Right. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. So now put a back end in there that is so powerful that I can do that on my cheap device. Yeah. And on any device and I can transition from device to device. I don't have to buy anything in particular to be able to use my yes. games and the transition is happening but the transition is going to be difficult for people like me who still like to go to the store and buy a game and yeah. and i actually kind of and if they hesitate. go out of business you take it with you and put it on yeah. it doesn't and matter I, yes. and yeah. i go i hesitate even buying digital copies of games like yeah. i like to have the actual game mm-hmm. but i understand that the future is is coming up quick and mm-hmm. I'm still going to buy a PS five, sure. but I'm going to also likely play games on Stadia. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting point. I, I want to 
just reiterate what you just said, which is I'm going to also play video games yes. on Stadia. Stadia. So I don't think that we're replacing that offline phone device. I think we're supplementing it and saying, yeah, an enhancement. hey, now, okay, you, you can you can also, when you're connected to the internet, play games that you can't play when you're offline that are like high end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where, okay, maybe this is just another con another platform. <gasps> we all have multiple platforms. Well, they have that for right? VR. I wonder if they'll have, like... Now, here's... No, the latency is too high for VR. Here's the question I would you, have. Gotta be able, it's got to be able to track you. With this. Right now. So, I mean, like you've brought up VR, which, you know, totally That's makes in sense. in the far future, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> what about things like frame rate? Like, as you said, 60p, you know, 4K, that's pretty good to me. No, but <laughs> no, yeah, I, I hear you, but you're talking about the screen resolution. I mean, if your internet can't keep up, it's going to impact your gameplay. Do, sure. Do you remember yeah. when we, it used to be like, oh, I'm lagging so bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, are we, yeah. Is, is this opening yeah. the door to go back to <laughs> lagging? Are my, are my kids going to go... What is yes. <clears throat> However, consider this as, and I know we, we do need to move on to the next story, yeah. but consider that the very companies that are pushing the technology shift are the same companies who are controlling the introduction of like Google's gigabit fiber to the home. Right. Right. So yeah, if that's the, so, you know, it's going to perform well. It's like you, you, you just know that that's what they're driving toward. And, and, they're not going to build a service that's going to fail based on that. This latency is a big thing. Sure, for sure. Yeah. And because this is internet based, it's going to be it's going to resolve the cross platform compatibility issues. It's an interesting thing though because you have to remember that this is not game streaming, this is video streaming. Mm -hmm. We've already proven through YouTube and through everything else that video streaming is great these days. Yep. There's no latency on videos like like really in real time if, the, if it was real time. So they've created real time video streaming service that has the interactivity of controls mm -hmm. and a control doesn't take a lot of bandwidth. No. So it's like it's instant as long as you don't have high pings. Right. As long as you don't have latency on your Internet connection. And that's the key thing. And so they'll be driving ISPs to support their codecs and yeah, we're, we'll see an evolution in that kind of thing. It's gonna be that's, interesting. That's gonna interesting. We're in it like a it. cuspy kind of time now. Yeah. Oh, very cool. If you've tried Stadia or any other cloud-based service, comment below. Let us know if you've been contemplating it. Maybe post why you haven't tried it yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's holding you up? Artist Simon Weckert noticed something unusual at a May Day demonstration in Berlin. Google Maps showed that there was a massive traffic jam, even though there were zero cars on the road. Soon enough, Wicket realized that it was the mass of people, or more specifically, their smartphones, that had inadvertently tricked Google into seeing gridlock on an empty street. And then he decided to do it himself. Wickert says, quote, the question was if it might be possible to generate something like this in a much simpler way. I don't need the people. I just need their smartphones, end quote. So he borrowed phones from friends and rental companies until he had acquired 99 devices, which he piled into a little red wagon. The plan was simple. Over the course of a day, Wecker would walk up and down a given street, mostly at random, towing his smartphone-packed wagon behind him. The effect wasn't instantaneous. It took Google Maps about an hour to catch up. But eventually, inevitably, Wecker said that his wagon would create a huge, long red line in the app, indicating that a traffic had slowed to a crawl, even though there wasn't any traffic at all. He had effectively tricked the system into thinking a series of large buses was crawling back and forth. Google said in a statement, quote, traffic data in Google Maps is refreshed continuously thanks to information from a variety of sources, including aggregated and anonymized data from people who have location services turned on and contributions from the Google Maps community, end quote. They note that while it had figured out how to distinguish between cars and motorcycles, it does not yet have any way to filter for a Weckert setup. Weckert says, quote, what I'm really interested in generally is the connection between technology and society and the impact of technology, how it shapes us, end quote. 
The hack is getting attention, not only because it's fun, but also serves as a necessary reminder that the systems people take for granted involve inputs and outputs and that they themselves are sometimes both. It shows how simple it is to be it, how simple it is to fool a product in which people place a tremendous amount of trust. That is interesting. That that's a lot of fun, but I love how the artist has found the spin to say, "Hey, maybe we're trusting the technology a little too much that yeah. so much so that anyone looking at their app or using their GPS that's powered by Google services yes. is avoiding those areas based on his little experiment. Right. So when, when I had first heard the story, I thought to myself, okay, so four <clears throat> people are in a car. Like if you're carpooling and you're yeah. stuck in a slow section of the highway, mm -hmm. is it going to show up way busier on the highway than it actually that's, is? It's completely, it yeah. yeah. That's nuts. <laughs> I, I, I personally use Waze, which is owned by Google. It, mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's, I think it's the exact same. Well, no, there's some enhanced features that Google Maps it's doesn't spelled have. differently. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but what I like about Waze is, is that it is user input. Mm -hmm. Unlike a lot of Google Maps that is drawn by anonymous user data and things happening in the back end. Mm -hmm. So Waze builds off uh, Google Maps, but then you can add your individual um, mm -hmm. components into it. But I have at times had a phone call or a text or something come in where it's like, I need to respond to this. So I'll pull over on the side of the road do the thing that I need to do. And all of a sudden I get an alert on my phone. We're detecting a slowdown. Oh, you know, yeah. are you in traffic? How heavy is the traffic? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Busy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm pulled over. And so I'll, I'll say no and move on. They're but like, I, this is, this is odd. Jeff is not texting while driving. <laughs> no, I this is out of character for you. I follow the rules. <laughs> but, um, what, uh, what I could have done is gone. Yes. Heavy traffic. Sure. Traffic's flowing yeah. beside me, but, yeah. So, I mean, there is that user element. So I've never fully trusted the information I see mm -hmm. on those services because I know that there is that user input data. Right. Actually, today on my way to the studio, I always use Google Maps. I, even though I know how to get here, I always use it. I like, I like to be told what to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Google told me to take the highway and I looked at the highway and I thought, ah, uh -uh, that's a dead stop. And Google was pretty mad at me. Like it kept trying ah. to direct me back to the highway, but I was like, mm, I am taking the main road. Was it just that one spot? And then it was fine after? I don't know. Yeah. There's one spot on the highway right now, oh. but okay. So this, <laughs> this opens up something though, interesting about, and I know we need to move to the next story, but about proximity, how specific is location-based services on the phone? Cause like yeah. my kids play Pokemon go. Yeah. So when they're at home, if they move from one side of the living room to the next, their character moves with them. Yeah. But when I'm sitting in the car, I'm getting a bigger blip on the map. And so I don't know if it can update as quick to my precise it, location. It's probably lulling you into a, a false sense of like anonymity. It knows exactly where you, it knows well, exactly where you're parked. So then <laughs> could Google have not built something into the programming that it watches for the collection of devices and it goes, there are 99 within this box. That's not actual. I think they will I now, I think they're Jeff. working on that in this present moment. So it, it is I something they, they saw do. him coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Definitely. The wagon foiled us again. <laughs> okay, we have got to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Arm has announced the Ethos U55 and the Cortex M55 for Edge devices, bringing an AI neural network accelerator to future smart speakers, light bulbs, fridges, and other IoT devices. The more powerful of the two, known as the Cortex M55, is a general microcontroller grade CPU blueprint while the other, named Ethos U55, is essentially an AI accelerator. The Cortex M55 is based on ARM's Helium technology. The Ethos U55, on the other hand, is a novel architecture for ARM and has been described as a micro neural processing unit, or micro NPU for short. Both processors are available now to license and are intended to be used together. The M55 running application code 
the U55 doing all the neural network mathematics in fast hardware. The senior director of the IoT and embedded team at ARM says, quote, the micro NPU cannot be used on its own. It needs to be paired with a CPU like the Cortex M55. Together, this system delivers 480 times the performance compared to previous Cortex M generations working on their own, end quote. We expect to see chips using these blueprints early next year. Awesome. I can't believe this is real life that <laughs> neural fun. processing units are now I a know. part of an SOC. Like this is yeah. so it's just sci-fi to my well, exactly. 1980s mind. Like I, re I remember when, uh, which Star Trek was it where they use um, the neural packs? Uh, neural pack? Uh, what are they called? Oh my gosh. One of the Star Treks, was it Enterprise maybe? Where there's like a... Oh, to, to have like telepresence? Yeah, within the, the ship and like they would blow out and they'd have to replace them. And they were like these gel pack things. And I'm like, that would never happen. Oh, okay. uh, I think it was Star Trek. I don't think that's what this is. <laughs> no, no, I understand, no, no, I understand that. But, <laughs> but I remember watching that. I think it was Star Trek Enterprise. And I was like, there's no way we're going to have that kind of advanced technology. It's not possible. And this is like 15, 20 years ago. And now I'm watching stuff like this come where it's like neural networks. I'm like, oh my goodness. Every year there's a new possibility. And I never would have expected this. This is, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, so we're talking like the next gen of yes. AI. Which is that, so crazy. That these little chips can now process teraflops worth of information. Like it's, Tiny I don't know what it really is, but it's like ridiculous amounts of data having to do with ai right so that the so that the next thing is that you know coders will be able to make thinking devices so those smart speakers with this with this technology will be smarter yeah what's well, interesting change to me bolts. is the fact that they're two separate things like i'm surprised that well they don't you have stress. to have a cpu you have to have the ability to run traditional code yeah Right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to, like, you wouldn't be able to, as a human, interact with it. Yeah. There has to be a layer for humans to be able to access the NPU. Yeah. That... Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'd just blow our minds. Now, how quickly before this would be adapted for phones? And well, like, we already have devices. AI technology in phones. Right. But, but I mean, at this level. I don't know. Like, because that could change mobile computing. Sure. It's going to change a lot of stuff. Oh, it's going to be but wild. But that's the idea is that it's getting faster, smaller, yeah. and more integrated. That's the way technology goes. And oh. so we're seeing a, a massive shift in how data is processed because we're specifically looking toward AI. We're not far and from, machine a, learning. from a Jarvis mm -hmm. in our little classes. Attackers behind one of the world's most more destructive pieces of ransomware have found a new way to defeat defenses that might otherwise prevent the attack from encrypt encrypting data. Installing a buggy driver first and then hacking it to burrow deeper into the targeted computer. The ransomware in this case is Robinhood, known for taking down the city of Baltimore networks and systems in Greenville, North Carolina. Robinhood can easily encrypt sensitive files once a vulnerability has allowed the malware to gain a toehold. For networks that are better fortified, the ransomware has a harder time breaking in. Now, Robinhood has found a way to defeat these defenses. In two recent attacks, researchers from security firm Sophos said the ransomware has used its access to a targeted machine to install a driver from Taiwan-based motherboard manufacturer Gigabyte that has a known vulnerability in it. It's the same vulnerability that led to Gigabyte officials discontinuing the use of the driver. But since it contains Gigabyte's cryptographic signature, the Windows operating system trusts it and allows it to it allows it to run in the highly sensitive Windows kernel region of the OS without question. With the benign but buggy driver installed, Robinhood then exploited the vulnerability to gain the ability to read and write to virtually any memory region chosen by the attacker. The Robinhood exploit changed a single byte to disable the Windows requirement that drivers be signed. With that, 
Robinhood installed its own unsigned driver that used its highly privileged kernel access to kill processes and files belonging to endpoint security products. The advanced status of the driver gave it greater ability than other techniques to ensure that the targeted processes are permanently stopped. There are other Windows trusted drivers with known vulnerabilities that could be used in the same way of Gigabyte's drivers. These include signed drivers from VirtualBox, Novel, CPU-Z, and Asus. And while the Gigabyte driver may be the first known instance of this type of hack, it, is, it very well may not be the last and points to a need for Microsoft to reassess the way their certificate revocation procedures. Mm. That's tough. Because mm -hmm. uh, the part of me wants to say, oh, we'll just rev revoke the certificate anytime there's an exploit. But remember that then that would nullify everybody's drivers. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is almost, I mean, as I'm hearing it, this is like a new wave of Trojan attack, so to speak. Yes. That's what it feels like. Right. Like you're coming in through trusted uh, yeah trusted source to get access is that not the basic principle behind it or is it a, a whole different way of it just feels it? like so they're using it as an elevated privilege tactic mm -hmm. so they're using uh, a, a driver that windows trusts because of the signature being valid so it's not a fake driver it's not like a malware it is a legitimate driver but it has a bug in it Mm -hmm. that caused it to be recalled, basically. But the Windows operating system, no matter what version you're running, still trusts the installer for that driver because of the certificate that is applied to it. And so the hackers are using that to then be able to elevate their privileges and do whatever the heck they want. Right. And that's the scary thing, because how do you stop that? How can you possibly stop that? I think it comes down to where's your first line of defense? I think the only thing you have to, that you can look at is how did they get in in the first place? Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. it a phishing scam? Was it somebody clicked on an email that had some fileless malware that allowed somebody to run something resident in their computer? Is it that you have remote desktop turned on on one of your computers on your network? And that's really easy to hack. Now, I don't know how certificates work just because I, I haven't delved into that, mm -hmm. but does each certificate and each driver have its own like certificate identifier? No, the driver doesn't have its own certificate, but the company that manufactures the driver does. So that certificate says yes to Microsoft. This is a gigabyte driver provided by gigabyte because it contains the certificate that proves that this is a legitimate driver from gigabyte. So what if the certificate system changed in such a way that you have your your main certificate, say for Gigabyte, but then you have your sub certificates for each driver rollout so that it identifies this driver as this subset. Yeah. Would as, that as help a, identify the As issue? a developer, I feel like that's, you're, you're giving me nightmares right now, Jeff. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm just trying to think outside the box. Like, I like where you're going, but it, it just sounds like a logistical nightmare as far as managing those certificates. Like it could just be a nightmare. I think maybe um, some kind of an heuristic analysis that is able to identify, maybe it's a checksum that identifies known faulty drivers or deprecated drivers right. so that Windows could say, yes, this is a valid certificate. However, Gigabyte has marked this certificate or this installer as bad. Right. Ah, it's got to be some kind of an, an identifier. Yeah. It's gotta It'll be, be interesting. Linux. Yeah, do that. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and problem solved. That's the answer. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Thanks for being here, everybody. That is all the time that we have. I hope you've had fun. It's been a, a good week for you, and we look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday. Take care, everybody. See ya. Bye.